Hey there. Whew. Glad you're here today. I'm just getting warmed up because we've got quite a workout on our hands. We're dealing with Clement of Alexandria today. And in some ways, uh, he's one of the most accessible, easy to read, at least in some texts. And in other ways, he gets to talking about Gnosis, but he's not quite a Gnostic. And he talks about salvation, but he talks about it in terms of something to do with, I mean, deification. And sometimes it can be really tough. So we're going to have to flex our academic muscles today, uh, dig in deep. But I think this will be helpful to you. Because as we try to figure out some of the things that we've seen in other videos, how does all of this relate to salvation? What's the wrong view that the heretics have messed up on so bad? And what's so important about getting this right? And that's where Clement is going to try to tie it all together for us. Uh, according to tradition, he taught the catechetical school. He taught new Christians. And what we've gotten into today is not the new stuff. This is more of the meat of the word, not the milk of the word. But I think as a teacher, he's still going to be helpful to us. So I hope uh, you'll stay tuned and we'll see what we learn from Clement of Alexander. cleaned up and ready to be a little more uh, professional because we got to get to work. We got to we got to be serious here about Clement of Alexandria because he is often misunderstood. He has a mixed heritage as to how well he was received. And one of the biggest reasons is because he will use this word uh, gnosis, knowledge, in a way that's hard to figure out how does he mean it. He he calls himself a gnostic and thinks gnostic gnostics are good. So is he a heretic? Well, in his own day, no. In fact, the odd thing about his use of this word Gnostic, uh, Gnosis is that he actually attacks the Gnostics that we all think of as heretical. So Irenaeus that we saw in the last series of videos is attacking specific groups of Gnostics like the Valentinians, and Clement of Alexandria is attacking those same groups. It's just he comes at it from sort of a very different posture. Whereas Irenaeus is very much confrontational, you Gnostics say this, you're wrong. Clement of Alexandria can, can be confrontational, but he's mostly saying things like, hey, uh, I'm a Gnostic too. Gnosis is good, but let me tell you about the right kind of Gnosis. And afterward, knowledge, that Greek word Gnosis, is in our New Testament. It is an important, valued word. And I think Clement is trying to redeem that word and get it back from the heretics, and, and, and put it in its right orthodox sense. Now, I think the best way to sort of try to figure out Clement uh, on this issue and how Gnosis relates to salvation is to first keep in mind the object of Gnosis. This is not knowledge of secret ways of reading the Bible. It's not knowledge of secret things hiding up in the clouds, these, these extra eons and things like that. It's not, not no, that kind of gnosis. Instead, it's gnosis of God. Knowledge of God. That's the goal. And not only is that the end, that's the means. By knowing God, you are saved. Salvation is bound up as both I'll say this now and we'll explain later, both a process and the end goal. So stay tuned to this whole video. We'll come back to that idea of Gnosis being both the ends and the mean. But let me break it down this way. I think uh, if you remember how much Irenaeus had to fight the bad Gnostics, because the bad Gnostics seem to say that the body's not good, then you realize that Irenaeus is trying to emphasize the goodness of the body. The Gnostics only emphasize the goodness of the soul. Well, Clement of Alexandria would agree with Irenaeus on that, but he doesn't quite put the emphasis on the body. The body to him, he wants to keep in its proper arrangement in relation to the soul. 
So the soul is the higher faculty of the human person, and the human person is made up of both body and soul. But it's important that the soul is higher because it should be a one-way street. The soul should guide the body and tell the body what to do. Now once you get that, you start to pay attention to how gnosis works. And here's where I'm really oversimplifying things, but I think it's helpful in this introductory video to start here. If you were to ask Clement of Alexandria, where does one experience gnosis, he would start by saying gnosis happens in the mind or in the soul. Now, I say it's more complicated because what he really, really wants to get at is the fact that you actually experience gnosis bodily. That's where the Gnostics got it all wrong, and he gets there. But that's not where he starts, and I don't think that's the best thing to, to think about as you're first reading him on salvation. When you read Clement of Alexandria, if you would agree with what most of the ancient world would say in, in this Greek way of thinking, gnosis is a faculty of the mind, but praxis, what things you do, is the faculty of the body. But they should go hand in glove. The things you know should be determine the things you do. So Clement of Alexandria is sort of um, trying to embody the things of the soul, but again, he's always going to insist on the right order. So it would be very tempting to say that virtue is an inner faculty and a faculty of the soul for Clement, but that's not all it is. There are virtuous motivations but there's also virtuous actions. So you see, it goes from gnosis, a mental psychological experience, to praxis, an embodied experience, and they should always go one after the other. So maybe for an example, we could talk about specific virtuous acts. He takes on this issue of wealth, uh, right? Jesus talks about giving your money to the poor. He, even at one point, uh, talks about giving all your money away. So is that apply to everybody? Well, Clement of Alexandria doesn't think so, because not because he thinks people shouldn't be giving away their money. The Christians should be charitable people. But this isn't a pastoral treatise. He's trying to take on the big sort of in-principle question, a philosophical, almost like systematic theologian. What about every possible case? What's the principle that guides it? And one case he can think of is people who are already poor. If you don't have any money, is it then true that you can't obey Jesus and give your money away? Well, no, says Clement, because what you have to keep in mind is this body-soul reaction, and that you know in your mind that you should give to the poor, and therefore you have the right virtu virtuous motivation, whether or not you have any physical money to give. So even if your body can't follow through on the virtuous motive through virtuous acts, you've still got the right gnosis. But of course, once you say that, it's clear for Clement that if you do have the money, then you have to follow your virtuous motives. You have to follow through with virtuous actions. I think, to quote James, we would say that faith without works is dead. But now, he's, got some, he's onto something because there are a lot of people who have a lot of money, and they actually give a lot of money, but for the wrong motives. They're giving it just to be seen. They're giving it because they think that's giving them attention, that it's earning them rewards in heaven. He points out, even if there was never any reward, if there was never any heaven, you should do it out of pure altruism. You see this internal knowledge that God is a generous God and we should be generous people, they, that, that should flow from the soul to the body. But he has this sort of ability to say, even if you can't do the virtuous act, of giving money if you have no money. You are virtuous in terms of your soul. You see, it's the gnosis of God that leads to salvation. And of course, then you should work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, you could take other examples. Remember, Irenaeus has to work really hard on the sacraments to talk about how good the sacraments are physically, materially. Well, uh, Clement of Alexandria agrees with that. He never denies that. But all the emphasis comes back to the soul. So he will talk about uh, several things like being baptized in such a way that you almost wonder, is the physical water important? Does it matter? And he never denies its importance. But that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is on the internal state. There should be a, uh, a, an internal baptism. And this shows up in a lot of other Christian writers as well. There's an internal baptism that happens 
a baptism by faith, some writers will call it, a baptism by repentance, other writers will call it. Clement of Alexandria calls it something along the lines of a Gnostic baptism. And he doesn't mean the heretical kind. He means your soul, internally, you already know a state of repentance. You already know a state of being washed and filled with the Spirit of God. And if you, in theory, could never get to the baptistry, you've been baptized internally. But now once you've got this theory, once you've got this principle, it's clear you should be baptized. Why would anyone not follow through on this? The other example, the, the other end of sort of a Christian life is martyrdom. Irene, uh, Clement of Alexandria t- wants you to be a Gnostic martyr. Why would he want you to be a Gnostic martyr? Well, for one, the Gnostics apparently don't believe in martyrdom because what you do with your body doesn't matter. Clement of Alexandria wants to take this further, though. In principle, even if a Christian cannot actually go down to the arena, be thrown to the lions, and die as a martyr, you can die to self. There is this internal state of the soul where you know you should be uh, in a state of death to self, whether or not it works itself out in its body, in your body. And if you're arrested, you don't get to say, well, it's, it's okay, I'm already a Gnostic in my mind. No, if you're a Gnostic in your mind, truly, in your soul, then it will work itself out if you're given the opportunity. And of course, like we've seen in other texts, like Perpetua and others, Christians believed that this martyrdom was a second baptism, but really it's just the outworking of the first baptism. If you die in the arena or if you die in your old age, in your, in your bed at night, if you have died to self internally and are faithful to the end, you are a martyr. Maybe not a physical martyr the world sees, but at least a Gnostic martyr. Okay, so this duality, I think, is going to help us explain a lot about salvation. But I need to take a pause from that, uh, and we'll come back to salvation in the second video. Let's stop and talk about another very important matter that Clement of Alexandria uh, gets us into. All right, Clement has some interesting, unique, difficult things to say about women. As a man, I can't exactly claim to know what it must feel like to read Clement uh, when he gets to these topics. So I'm going to do my best to try to be fair to um, Clement. We, I'm not going to try to defend him, but we need to at least try to understand him. But also be fair to the kind of questions that I think uh, not just women, but anyone would want to raise today uh, in light of how we think of the genders. So let's start with a quote from Clement. And this quote starts off pretty good, uh, but don't get your hopes too high. Because Clement has this uh, notorious saying where he talks about how women and men can philosophize equally. And, and just to give credit where credit is due, this was almost unheard of in the ancient world. So this is pretty remarkable that he has this statement in there at all. But now here's where he gets real. Clement goes on to say, women uh, are therefore to philosophize equally with men though males are preferable at everything. Well, of course he says that as a man, especially as a man from the ancient patriarchal society that he comes from. But it gets worse. He says women can philosophize with men, even though men are preferable at everything, unless the men have become effeminate or womanly. And he doesn't go on to elaborate exactly what he means by that, but we can all imagine so, okay, Clement, how come you can say that men and women can philosophize equally, but still you're putting men above women? So this is where he actually ends at this particular chapter. This is his conclusion that he gets to. Let me back up to the beginning of the chapter and show you another quote. And again, I'm not trying to defend him. I just want to understand how he gets there. Because he does have some positive things to say about women. Uh, let's start with the, the early part of this chapter. He, again, uh, emphasizes, or this is the first time he emphasizes the fact that all may philosophize. And here he's talking about all, all genders, all races, all classes. He's remarkably progressive in this way. He says, we admit the same nature exists in every race and the same virtue. And as respects human nature, the woman does not possess one nature and the man exhibit another, but the same. So also with virtue. Now, we're going to come back to that word nature. That's going to be an important buzzword we're going to need to remember in here. But notice how Clement is able to say that in terms of human nature, there's not a male human nature and a female human nature. 
men and women are equal in this way. And that means, as we said a while ago about the body-soul distinction, in terms of their soul, their mental, psychological capacity, they, they're, they're able to be equal with men. That's a remarkably progressive uh, egalitarian statement for the ancient world. But now, he knows there are differences between men and women. So if we go back to that chart we had about the body-soul hierarchy. Remember, the soul is more important than the body, and so that's a good start for him, and yet the body is also important, and here he sees differences. Let me read you this quote for him. He says, There is sameness as far as respects the soul. She, the woman, will attain to the same virtue. That's what we said a while ago. But as there is difference as respects to the peculiar construction of the body, and here is the difference he sees. She, the woman, is destined for childbearing and housekeeping. So, you can see then, if we put up our chart, in terms of the soul, here is where Clement is egalitarian. And this is the most important thing for Clement. Your soul is the higher part faculty of you, so there's not a male soul and a female soul. So in terms of the soul, men and women are equal. Is Clement a feminist? Well, so many problems defining that word, especially applying it to the ancient language. Here is Clement being um, egalitarian. He is in favor of women's equality in the terms of their psych psyche, their soul, their ability to be virtuous, their ability to philosophize. But in terms of their body, which he can't deny, he knows there are differences. So if we all get this, only uh, men can be daddies, only mommy uh, women can be mommies. Okay, so Clement can't get around this. He puts this in the terms of a woman being destined for, because of her body, she's, she's bound to be uh, someone who does childbearing and housekeeping. And why housekeeping is a part of that, I guess because the, in, the, the, the private space where the children are raised, that's the woman's domain. Well, okay, uh, this is all bound up in some of the biblical language you find in Paul. It's all bound up in his assumptions about how the ancient body works and how the ancient society works and women's roles. But then he does have a problem, because as soon as he says, this is what's natural, he goes on to start quoting other examples where it's not natural. Examples where women don't stick to these feminine roles. Uh, he gives the examples of the ancient Greek uh, uh, documents about the Amazons. These Amazon warriors who allegedly fought more fiercely than men. Now, he's not exactly happy that these Amazon women were acting in what he thought were manly roles, but he can't deny it. He, he thinks it's a historical fact, so what is he going to do about it? He then goes on to list people from all around the known world, people like the Sarmatians uh, from the Far East, people like the Iberians from the Far West. These are just on, beyond the borders of what uh, he, as a good sort of Greek speaker, would really know the details about, but the rumors are that these Sarmatian women fight with men in battle. And apparently they shoot their bows even more accurately uh, than the men. And the Iberian women work out in the field with the men. And he says all sorts of, uh, again, sort of stereotypical stuff we don't really want to further promote about how they just have babies and go on picking their crops and stuff that we... you got to do better about how you talk about this, but he's aware that these women have just as much of a public, uh, manual labor kind of role that the men do all in all these different societies. And what is he to make of this? He just doesn't quite know. And so he comes back to his formula that men and women can philosophize equally, but now he's going to make sure and be clear, his view is, men are preferable in all things. But really the way he got there was, even though the soul's the higher faculty and they're equal there, the body is still a reality and they're not equal there. Not only they're not equal, the men are stronger, etc., so, for Clement of Alexandria now, he's stuck. Because he's got this distinction, a distinction that we would make between body and soul, and then he's got these other outliers. The Amazons, the Sarmatians, the, the Iberians. What to do with those women who don't fit into his understanding of women's roles? Well, here is one of the difficulties, is he does not have a third category for that. We, in the most modern languages, most modern uh, grammar and uh, the ways that we talk about how gender works, we locate gender as a grammatical category. 
It's a cultural category for us. Uh, we don't do it in English as much, but it's still there. If someone talks about a ship, we say, she's a good ship. Now, why is the ship she? Is the ship female? No, not in any biological way. There's no female, female anatomy of the ship. The, female, the ship is just not female, but feminine in our grammar. Uh, so I took high school Spanish. Uh, the, the, the Spanish word for table is la mesa, la, women, fe feminine table. Is the table female? No, not in a biological, sexual sense. The table is feminine in a grammatical, cultural sense. Uh, in Germany, there's a word for table, der Tafel, der, uh, his, masculine. You see, uh, the table in Germany is masculine, and the table in Spain is feminine. Now, why do they have male tables in Germany and female tables in Spain? They don't. Neither is male nor female. That's a biological uh, sexual category that's different from the difference between sex and gender. Gender is a grammatical category, and grammar differs from language to language and from culture to culture. So why is it that in some cultures women are supposed to be inside doing the cooking? Whereas in some uh, cultures, like Chilean culture, my supervisor, uh, his PhD, talked about how much he was the cook in the house. He loved the cooking because Chilean men cook. Now, does that mean that his version of men is a feminine version? It would be to Clement of Alexandria, but not to his culture, not to his uh, feminine... Uh, masculine feminine roles are defined differently in different cultures and that's what Clement of Alexandria doesn't have a good category for the word culture doesn't show up uh, for centuries later so what's he supposed to make of these Iberian women and these Sarmatian women and these Amazon women he just doesn't know and what's confusing to us is he uses this word nature and I need to just say another word about how nature does or doesn't work in helping him in his argument hear Clement of Alexandria talk about a man or a woman's nature, I told you I was going to come back to that word, we tend to think of nature as distinct from culture. There's the natural world and then there's all the stuff that we humans add to it and create in our culture. But that's not at all how the ancients thought of this. There is no category of culture. There is no distinct realm of nature that we humans are somehow above or not a part of. So, for example, when the Apostle Paul is dealing with this issue, uh, some of the problems in the Church of Corinth, he raises a, a problem uh, of shame, shameful according to nature. Uh, he says, does not nature itself teach you, and I get quoted this from time to time by beloved family members who think I need a haircut. They say, does not nature itself teach you that it is a shame for a man to have long hair? But then he goes on. Paul says this is a, not a law. right? There is no law. The church has no law against these things. And so there's really nothing he can do about it. Now, wait a minute. Isn't it going against natural law? Well, no, because that's not what Paul is talking about when he says nature. In the ancient world, Paul doesn't have the category culture. If you go back to, say, Aristotle and read his book on nature, on physics, the idea of nature applies to all the realms of, of human existence. So there is the nature of biology, the nature of the body, there's the nature of plants and animals, all those things, and there is the nature of the soul, the nature of the mind, the psyche, the emotions. And he's not done. For Aristotle, included in nature is politics. You see, uh, societal laws, those are natural. Uh, a for the Athenians, it's natural to be democratic. For the Persians, it's natural to be monarchical. So what does he mean by natural there? He doesn't mean the nature of their bodies make them this way. He means the nature of society, what we would say culture. Some culture or societal natures tend this way, some tend that way. Who knows the forces that got them there in the past, but the nature of the Athenian society is such, and the nature of the Persian society is another. This is all bound up in nature. So what does Paul, what does Clement of Alexandria mean when they use the word nature? Well, it depends. Sometimes when he says nature, he means the nature of the body and is the nature of a woman to bear children, but in terms of the body. But in other terms, Clement can say it's the nature of a woman to be equal with men in terms of the soul, in terms of virtue, in terms of philosophy, 
And the good news out of all of this, we've taken a long time to talk about women, to try to at least get at his language and his categories. The best news out of all of this for Clement, whether or not he's done right by women in, in this, is a fair concern. But what he really is able to say is what Paul says, that in Christ there is neither male nor female. Now, maybe in society there is, maybe even in the body there is, but not in Christ. In Christ, we are neither male nor female. In Christ, we are neither barbarian nor Greek. We are neither rich nor poor, slave nor free. In Christ, all can be saved. All can have gnosis, knowledge of God. So that's where we need to come back and get um, back to uh, how all, even women, can be saved and what that salvation looks like for Clement of Alexandria. Well, I told you it'd be quite a workout today. Uh, we had to flex our muscles, our, our intellectual muscles, and we haven't got it all worked out yet. So, so stay loose, stay warmed up. We're going to come back and talk more about salvation. We sort of got it started, and we, we talked about the body-soul relation and how it should flow. Your, your knowledge of God is the ends and the means. So by knowing God... It flows from your soul through your body in all these you know, various ways, like uh, virtuous acts, almsgiving, things like that. Uh, well, we're going to come back and try to get a more holistic picture. What is uh, Clement of Alexandria envisioning when he talks about salvation? Because the big picture might be a bit different than what we're used to seeing. So come back for the next video, and we'll take on Clement of Alexandria one more time. Got our workout in, didn't we? Okay, let's go get a treat.